In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. In this morning's Gospel, my dear brethren, we hear of St. John the Baptist's witness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what are the circumstances surrounding what are the circumstances surrounding this morning's gospel reading from John chapter 3, verses 22 to 36? First of all, after the Lord Jesus Christ's first miracle at the wedding of Cana in Galilee, he travels to Jerusalem for the Passover and he cleanses the temple and preaches there. In the Gospel of St. John, in chapter 2, we read, And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, the, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. We also see later in the same chapter how many believed in him when they saw his miracles. In John chapter 2 verse 23, we recall, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he did. Here we can also mention the important dialogue that takes place between the Lord and Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee and he was a ruler of the Jews where Christ explains to him that he must be born again. And we find this dialogue at the beginning of John chapter 3, where Nicodemus says to Christ, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus does not understand this. And Christ explains further, saying to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And here Christ was speaking of Christian baptism, which was to come after his resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ then comes to Judea with his disciples where he baptized. In fact, Christ himself did not baptize, but it was his disciples who did so, as is clear from the beginning of chapter 4 in the Gospel of St. John, the first two verses. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples. The Lord Christ himself did not baptize, since baptism would not have the power to forgive sins until after his death and resurrection. In John chapter 7, verse 39, we read, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the baptism of the disciples 
was then the same as that of St. John. It was a baptism of purification. It is clear then that there can only be one baptism for the remission of sins which the Lord Jesus Christ established himself after the resurrection by saying to his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, as mentioned in Matthew 28, 19. And notice here that he says to them to make disciples of all nations. Christ didn't just come for Copts. He didn't just come for Egyptians or Sudanese or Ethiopians, but he came to save the whole world. And he makes this command of his disciples and his apostles to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. St. John the Baptist was also baptizing in Anon, near Salim, a baptism of purification, as this gospel tells us. Since there was much water there, and what does that mean? This means that it was deep water, since he did not only wash people's faces, but in fact, it was a type of baptism with a full immersion as a preparation for Christian baptism after the resurrection of Christ. Here we see a dispute also takes place between some of St. John's disciples and the Jews concerning purification. St. John's disciples were disturbed that people were following Jesus and they were leaving St. John. However, St. John begins to explain to them that he is not the Christ and that he was sent to prepare the way for the Lord and Savior. St. John also explained to them that he is unworthy to even loose the sandal straps of Christ, and that he, meaning Christ, must increase, and he, that is St. John the Baptist, must decrease. St. John is the angel mentioned in the book of Malachi in the Old Testament in chapter 3, verse 1, who came to prepare the way for the Lord. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, as mentioned in Malachi 3.1. St. John is the one who knew the Lord Jesus Christ from his mother's womb and leaped. So St. John witnessed to Christ and made his disciples aware that they were to follow Christ as he is the Messiah the savior of the world. St. John the Baptist announced that Jesus was the Lamb of God. And this announcement is a discovery about the truth of Christ, which St. John did not previously know. As he said, I did not know him. Before this time when St. John spoke about Christ, he said his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. However, what St. John saw at the Jordan was completely different. He saw a true lamb carrying all the sins of the world, he is the Lamb of God, chosen of God to remove our sins and to wash them in the river of baptism. This is the Messiah of the Jordan, whom we see each day at the baptism, always ready to carry the sins 
of those who are willing to accept him. The next day also, St. John was standing with two of his disciples and saw Jesus walking by and said, This is the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him and followed Jesus. Here St. John revealed the second time the discovery of the slain lamb. And this announcement led the disciples of St. John to follow the Lord Christ. So the secret of following Jesus and preaching in his name can be found in discovering him as the Lamb of God. Christ is the true Lamb of God who is present with us on the altar every day in every liturgy that we attend and celebrate. And we need to ask ourselves, do we place our sins on him? Are we united to the slain Lamb? Do we announce him to everyone and point to him on the altar? in order that many will accept and come to him. This is the message of everyone who knows the Lamb. It is our duty as Christians, just as St. John witnessed to, to Christ, we also need to witness to him every day and on every occasion. In today's modern world, there are many people who are confused and do not know Christ as God and Savior. And there are many conflicting accounts of who Christ is in the world, usually around the time of Nativity and Easter. In particular, we see in newspapers and magazines and some TV programs and even some books that question the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are also cults who are still in existence who mislead millions of people to who Christ truly is as God and Savior. <coughs> and I'm speaking of such cults as the Mormons, who are very active here in America, <clears throat> and also the Jehovah's Witnesses and many other heretics. There is even those that are dangerous because they dress like Coptic monks and bishops. And I mean this person that maybe some of you have seen on social media from Australia, calling himself Mar Mari, and many Copts are following him. He's a heretic. He's not a, he's not a Christian. And he's an historian following after the heresy of Nestorius at the time of the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431 AD when the Patriarch of Alexandria, St. Cyril of Alexandria, stood against the heresy of, Nestor of Nestorius, and he was condemned by 200 bishops. And this church still exists till today, called the Assyrian Church of the East. And this figure, who now dresses himself with a the Alaswa of the Copts and looks like a Coptic bishop and yet he is an historian. He was even excommunicated from his own church. Behind him he puts a picture of St. Paul Krolus to attract the Copts and when I tell people don't follow this man, they say, but he's saying nothing wrong. He's saying sweet words. And then I remind them that Arius, the priest of Alexandria, was also saying sweet words and putting his erroneous teaching in poems and music, and people were deceived by him. 
don't follow after these people because they have a lot of deception and a lot of wrong teachings against who truly is Jesus Christ and who he is as the Lamb of God, God and Savior. As Orthodox Christians then, we have the truth of Christ in every opportunity that we have, just as St. John the Baptist did. We must witness to Christ, who is God and Savior, and not fear and be courageous in doing so in every opportunity that arises. And this reminds me of two stories, two incidents that happened some years ago with me. And every opportunity like this I take to witness to Christ and don't shy away from it. The first one, one morning I was going to grab a coffee from Starbucks. This was back in Los Angeles. And as I was entering, the weather was nice, not like the snow here in the winter. And there was some tables outside and two fellows sitting. And as I was walking in, one of them said something to me. I wasn't quite paying attention. And I just responded and said no. Went and got my coffee. And then on the way out, I said to myself, I should try and figure out what this person was trying to say to me. Obviously, I'm dressed in my monastic dress. And I went and approached him and greeted him. And I said, I didn't quite catch what you were asking me earlier. He said, I was asking you, you if you are a part of the Assassin's Creed. And some of you may know, I didn't know what that was at the time, but apparently a very popular game that many people play on their computer. I said to him, no, I'm not part of this, but I am a Christian, I'm Orthodox, I'm originally from Egypt, I'm Coptic, and I explained that I follow the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of the world. And we had some dialogue, and I threw some seeds, and I left. When I got home, I started to look up this Assassin's Creed to know why he was comparing me to them. And apparently one of the characters of the Assassin's Creed looks exactly almost like a Coptic monk in the way that he is dressed and even called in an Arabic name, Al Mu'allim, the teacher. Uh, I put a post up on my Facebook page about it at the time. But people out there, millions, know nothing about Christianity, know nothing about orthodoxy, and in every opportunity we have, we need to witness, throw the seeds, and some will bring back through fruits 30, 60, and 100 fold. The other story was in New Zealand, in Auckland, where I visited our church there, and I stay in the same motel every time. And again, one morning when there was not liturgy, I crossed the road where there was a coffee shop to pick up a coffee. On the way out, a New Zealand man stopped me and was asking me who I was, why I'm dressed like this, and we started a dialogue. So I never shy away from these dialogues. And this time, even more fruit came out of this dialogue. So I explained to him again who I was, what I represent, that I follow the Lord Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. And I said to him, we're having Vespers this evening and you're welcome to come with your wife and attend. And to my surprise that evening, he was living close to the church that he came. I welcomed him and his wife at the end of the service and invited them for a cup of coffee in the office afterwards, and we had a very fruitful dialogue. I gave them my email if they had any questions later. And they began a dialogue with me over several weeks, months, and years. And 
it was the year before last when he told me that he had started studying theology at our seminary in Sydney and that his wife had got more interested to study different translations of the Bible. And shortly after that, he emailed me and said, my wife and I want to be baptized and become Coptic Orthodox. And so I began a discussion with them. I sent them a whole catechism. I asked them to go and visit the parish priest there to continue their education. And some months later, both of them were baptized and joined the Coptic Orthodox Church. And I continue dialoguing with them till this day. So all from just a simple cup of coffee a simple dialogue on the street that God's Holy Spirit works through people and we must take every opportunity to witness to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to be courageous in doing so and not to fear and to leave God's Spirit to work. So this is the conclusion of St. John's speech about Christ. Here he reveals to us the grace of sonship and of everlasting life. In Christ's baptism, the Son of God is revealed, and the Father says with a clear and heard voice to man represented in Christ, the call of fatherhood, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So we entered into the grace of sonship and the joy of the Father. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, as mentioned in John 17, 3. Baptism then, my dear brethren, is our entering into eternal life and our acceptance of the grace of sonship in Christ. At the Jordan, Christ, the Lamb of God and the Bridegroom of the Church, whom came from above, was revealed to the whole world. There he poured his Spirit without measure and allowed us to enter into eternal life and granted us this grace of sonship. May the blessings of this morning's gospel fill your hearts with joy and hope and peace. And glory be to God.